Oh, welcome along to the All Black Podcast, brought to you by Vodafone. Uh, well, well, that's a high fizz start to it. That's great stuff. Joined uh, by Rob Dunn. Roundy, how are? Very good, thank you, mate. Excited? Yes, indeed. Uh, myself, Jay Reeve, I'll be taking you through it with Roundy and our very special guest today. 132 Test Cap All Black, Kevin Mialamu. Welcome along to the All Blacks Podcast, my friend. Thank you, Tim Talofa. Um, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it was a good uh, drive in this morning uh, to the city, so... Um, I'm excited. I'm pumped, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Well, thanks for climbing out of the gym long enough, because it looks like you've been you've been in there quite a bit. The carcass is in pretty good nick. Every single person that we've been talking to, getting you on this on this potty, has uh, has commented on the on the physique. What are you doing to stay in such good nick? Uh, no, actually, you need to stop now because I won't be able to, put outside, <laughs> to get outside of, outside this place. But um, no, it's just uh, no, just good to keep moving. I know I can feel it days that I'm uh, not moving, and uh, you know uh, when you're lucky enough to play. Uh, professional rugby for a while, for a long time, you just realise that uh, when you slow down, uh, that's when everything starts to hurt a bit more, you know, so I'm just trying to keep moving, with some good advice I got from some former rugby players, some good friends uh, when they finish, so I'm just trying to carry on and uh, make sure the body just keeps moving. Who are those lads and what have they been doing to keep their body moving? <laughs> good question. Um, I used to, uh, you know, even sharing with uh, Ronnie Clark and um, Andrew Blowers, a, a few of the guys that I, I was lucky enough to play alongside when I first started. And, um, you know, they finished before me and they were just, they, there was a couple of tips they shared with me and just, I said, to keep moving, um, arthritis comes on really quick. <laughs> so, What's it like when you when you play with those gentlemen and now you see their kids in those positions that you guys once held? Does that instantly age you or does it make you feel a, a huge sense of pride? A bit of both, actually. You know, um, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to hold, like, Caleb when he was a baby. <laughs> <you know>? so, <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, yeah, uh, to be able to see uh, um, both uh, Nico and um, and Caleb come through, and uh, what's even a bigger bonus, they're good men as well, good young men as well. So good to see them uh, uh, succeeding in their in their sport and rugby. But um, uh, they've been raised really well, so they they got some really good parents there. Yeah, incredible role models, and I guess it's kind of part of that the bigger whānau that rugby is, and that's that, that importance. I think we all remember going along to those those club rooms, uh, getting the punter of chips and a fizzy drink, and running around and watch watching your parents out on the field, or watching uh, friend, friends and family running around as well, which kind of puts you in good stead. And and as a result of that, what a, what a couple of great individuals that you guys have created, I guess, as a as a wider rugby group. Is there any truth to the rumor that uh, your your wife married an athlete, so therefore she wanted to maintain that? Uh, therefore, she got a gym set up so that she didn't have to have a pork <laughs> chop as a husband. Yeah, most probably. I uh, know. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we're, I'm really lucky to have such a strong foundation uh, like her there, and uh, she's been there from day one. And so uh, to be able to uh, have her, her support all the way through and uh, into life after rugby as well and into our business, um, she's the real backbone of uh, what we do at our gym. So good culture, good people, and um, if anything, you know, the the fitness side is the is, is part of it, but uh, being able to stay social and uh, get there, meet good people, work hard together, um, those are the things we love at our gym. And it was um, back in the day often you've heard about uh, the All Black culture and sweep the sheds. Would we find Kevin Minalamu <laughs> on the broom at the gym? Um, uh, probably a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> 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 but um, no, uh, that's part of it. You know, like uh, when, you, when you love something, uh, you, you pretty much you look after it well. And uh, that, that place is something that we started from uh, from an empty space, so you know, uh, no different to what uh, you guys are, you guys have done here. You, you look after it. You just uh, wanted to be a place where people enjoy coming to. So, life after rugby. You mentioned it just before. Uh, you step out of something. I mean, you've been in the you've been in the system for quite some time. You've been surrounded by great individuals that are all very driven. Was there that in the back of your mind when you started this business that it is it's getting similar people around you? It's that inspiring. It is it's being a leader, it's being led, it's being physical and achieving a goal together. Do you miss that camaraderie of of a footy shed and have you found it in, in this new business? There, there are parts of it that you find and um, definitely uh, through uh, sport you learn that uh, you got to surround yourself with uh, like-minded people and good people as well. Um, but uh, there's, there's things on a rugby field you just can't emulate off the field. You know, it's a physical sport. And so um, when we, if we take a, a scrum, uh, for instance, um, I need the person next to me to do his job so that I'm safe, so that I can go home and, um, and see my family. So I think when you start realising uh, that's, that's the strength of something like a, a game like rugby 
when we're in a um, in a scrum, everyone needs to do their part so that we all obviously win the ball in a, in a scrum, but we all come out of come out safely. So um, th- there are, there are a lot of things in rugby that you just can't emulate off the field, uh, but definitely those things like um, mateship and uh, getting some tight bonds, having good great people around you. These are things that you just you want to just keep bringing into your life as well. Do you think that the boots are hung up for good because? Jason, uh, the mighty cabbage Rutledge, the man. laced up the uh, man. and the back man. out on the paddock and and definitely 100% holding his own. And like we said at the beginning, the carcass is in really good nick. Is there any inkling, do you still get an itch for it? Is there a possibility that you'll scratch that with some sprigs at some stage in the not too distant future? <laughs> um, no, I'm definitely hung up. <laughs> <laughs> on the I'll record, lock, lock, done. Uh, <laughs> that cupboard's locked up, but... Um, <laughs> Oh man, I just—it's inspiring to see um, guys uh, be able to do that because um, I know as an um, ex-athlete and um, watching what the boys do every weekend, uh, and yeah, I'd, to be able to do that at that age and hold, you know, just hold his hold his um, his space and own it as well. Um, Help the boys get the win, you know, oh got man. the win over the Hawks Bay. Not too many of those for Southland, and he was a part of that, which is pretty awesome. Yes, and at forty-two, uh, that's a professional athlete, you know, <laughs> yeah. my man. Yeah, I oh, know nothing but uh, respect for him, mate. It was, um, you know, if we we go back in time a little bit, and it seems like quite a long time ago now. Um, you know, what sort of um, what happened for you through COVID? Was it, um, you know, probably the gym was shut. You know, you needed to uh, stay around home. Was it a time you enjoyed? Um, you know, at first, probably like everyone, like uh, it was uncertainty and not knowing uh, what uh, was going to happen the next day. So. Um, there was a, probably a little bit of anxiety to start with, and um, there's that just living in um, today where it's just you're just unsure of what t- tomorrow holds. Uh, so definitely a little bit of anxiety. Uh, having to close the gym as well uh, meant that um, uh, how we were going to keep the doors open as well. So as a small business and like a lo- lot of other small businesses as well, uh, that's playing in the back of your head. And um, um, I think mentally uh, it was actually a good space, especially the first lockdown, uh, when you realise actually um, you just got to take control of what you can and uh, not worry so much about um, things you can't control. So I enjoyed the time at home. It was great. I uh, had uh, some awesome uh, family time, had the chance to clean up the yard. <laughs> I had a tree line that was cut down like three years ago and never had a chance to clear the wood. So um, yeah, it was... My Let's wife honest, was standing out there going. There was a list on the fridge. <laughs> yeah, it was. Right, heavy. <laughs> One, two, three. Get through them. Yeah, no, no doubt. So um, I think uh, from a holistic point of view, it was awesome. You know, you get, had a chance to catch up with everyone, cook meals, and um, be able to really enjoy that time. There'll be a lot of people that are within that gym community that you've established that would have, in that time, looked to you for leadership again. Uh, and like a lot of people have over the years, whether it be on the paddock or off the paddock. How did you develop your leadership skills, and who were the leaders that you that you really looked up to uh, throughout throughout life in general, from from day dot yep. to where we are now? Um, you know, I've, I've been lucky to have such an awesome family. Like um, my parents, always been great leaders. You know, and um, I think for a lot of people, it's it's really easy to look straight past them, um, but they are the ones there from day one, and um, you find that their guidance throughout life is, is always special, you know, especially when you're a young person and having to take in some of the, the lessons that they're, they're telling you, you're always going, shaking your head going, what do they know, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and my kids are doing that to me now, so. No, I, I think um, uh, definitely my parents from day one and um, constantly surrounded by great people, so good coaches in, in my life, um, aunties and uncles, you know, um, the list goes on. There's just so many good people that uh, if, if you're surrounded by such good people, you just take a little bit from everyone. So um, definitely them and uh, and had some great rugby mentors as well. If we're going to drill into those coaches and those players and those and those footy mentors, who are the ones that kind of really really stick out for you in terms of? Because I mean, you've you've seen a few. Yeah, um, I I this is probably it's probably one thing I hate doing is when people say who 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 do you <laughs> like uh, playing alongside or who was your favourite coach because there's so many and I hate. Uh, singling, miss, one out. singling one out. I'll just say that um, uh, that everyone has something that, uh, good to give, but you just have to have your ears open and, and uh, be be willing to take something in. And sometimes uh, people's delivery are really different. So uh, some people that, that you connect with really easily, and then there's some that um, uh, probably uh, they send things. That, uh, you know, I like I like to be able to hear things clearly, uh, but when people are a little bit more direct, I'm, sometimes I take it uh, personally. 
Uh, then you, so you just got to learn, you know, okay, what is it they're trying, messages, messages they're trying to give me, lessons they're trying to give me, and uh, have an open mind to that. So uh, everyone, every coach I've had has, has something great to, that I've been able to take out of, out of off the rugby field and into life as well. Is it one of those things that as you get more mature and you and you're like you just said there, you you know what works for you and you know that when that person is having a conversation with you that that's what works for them. Is there a certain amount of maturity as you get through? Uh, the, I guess through the amount of caps that you've managed to mow through in your time where you start to become a lot more confident in who you are as a person and what you do as a job, therefore it makes it a little bit easier. What do you do to, to make sure that your upstairs is as just and good a nick as your body? I think as you become an older athlete, that's uh, what you start to rely on, uh, your experience, uh, how you handle moments, because uh, the body starts uh, flailing, you know, as, as you get older. And so, um, you know. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's in tatters. <laughs> you definitely re- you, you feel indestructible when you're young. Okay. And so, so most of it, that physical aspect is something that you really, um, um, it's the first thing you usually put forward. But uh, as you, if you're lucky enough to be in the game uh, long enough, you realize that uh, and play alongside some good people, especially like Richie, like Dan. Uh, you realise that's and and Ma as well. Like you realise this part of it is what is the the difference, especially in the big games as well. So being able to stay focused and be able to just um, stay in the moment, these things are really important. You know, we're talking now, and uh, you are you're a smiling assassin. That's what everyone says that you're the, just the happiest, most positive guy in the sheds, on the paddock. Uh, but when you when you get into that zone, when you put the jersey on, you become a savage. You are just a person <laughs> that nobody wants to be near. If there's if there's some if there's some heaviness that needs to be taken care of, but every single person who you've played against, whether they be international foe or, or domestic foe, they said that you're always you're always fear, uh, incredibly firm, much firmer than fear, uh, and hurt a lot when when your body <laughs> collides with theirs. How do you manage to keep such a cool head? Because I know a lot of people. Especially, you know, the you know the big boys in the front there. They like to bang. Uh, when they go, they like to go. You've had the bottle thrown at you uh, in the in the game, and was it in South Africa? <laughs> South Africa. And then you were by an old boy, and then you've also been popped by Cannon. I mean, there's a lot of people that would have loved to have seen you just absolutely push his teeth down his neck, but you managed to keep it. Keep a lid on it. Is there any moment where you've just gone, rightio, you've found my start button and I've got no idea where the stop is and I don't know if this is going to end in tears? Oh, Jay, I, I can tell you, I haven't always been this way. Like, um, I know in my earlier days, I used to react to everything, you know, and it's, it was, it's really hard trying to um, uh, separate uh, being uh, aggressive and clinical, you know, like, but but when you play rugby, you just realise that they're, they're, both, they're both those things, so... You have to be aggressive. You have to tackle someone hard or um, be physical in everything you do. But you still have to be clear enough to catch a ball and pass it. You know, like so. These are one of the the things I was talking about. You can't replicate off the field. It's really hard to be able to be uh, physical yet thinking about uh, what you're doing and and being able to be uh, really really good with the skill set at the same time. So um, I wasn't always. Uh, good at that but I just realised as I got older um, sometimes you just got to let things go in <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was, there one, was there one player in particular because I think a lot of the boys have got that person when you when you line up against each other we've even seen this, this is kind of schoolboy rugby when something tees off it'll be the halfback possibly gets messed with someone reaches through and grabs him and then everyone just almost just numbers off right here, where's, where's my opposition prop where's the, where's the hooker, where's my lock and you just go and, 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 and bang away <laughs> Jared, <laughs> Jared Howie Wada, <laughs> yeah. every single person yeah. is that person. Is, but yeah. Every single person is wearing the same number as him for some reason. Um, was there one player in particular, whether they be international or domestic, that you always loved going up against? It might not have been just because you wanted to chop them in half, but just because they tested you physically yep. and, and they were the benchmark and where you wanted to be operating. Yeah, and um, you know, I can say for these guys, they, they don't play the same position, but you knew when you played against them, uh, you had to be at your best. And so guys like, um, guys like George Gregan, yeah, uh, guys like um, Justin Marshall, you know, and because of the position they they play in, they're in that same vicinity as that, yeah. that we have to defend around, you know, run that ruck, uh, and they always run past you, you know. <laughs> so like, <laughs> you're always trying to, get, you always want to make sure you do a good job when you tackle them, but it's hard to catch them, you know. So <laughs> those two, when I'm when I'm thinking about, um, I need to make sure I'm on my um, on my job, and then when when I think physically, a uh, guy that would always uh, and this. I talk with respect for these three guys as uh, Pucky's both are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was, um, I don't know, six foot seven giant and um, prime beef, you know. Yeah. So um, 
I would always laugh because you know he'd always do the sign of the cross as he came on the field, and um, <laughs> he would be d- annihilating guys on the field. You know, <laughs> he's an assassin. Yeah. assassin. That's why. Yeah, he was assassin, and um, yeah. Whenever we used to play against uh, each other, um, it would be um, hammer and tongs for the whole 80 minutes, and I really enjoyed that. And um, I remember trying to move him a couple of times in a ruck, throwing everything I had at him. I'd bounce off, and he'd be smiling <laughs> at me, you know. <laughs> and I didn't realise how big he was until after one of the games in uh, in Pretoria at, at the Bulls, and he was holding his gill. Uh, he just had his um, he had his jandals on it, and I was standing next to him, and I just realised how big he was. And how silly I was for ever thinking I could move him on the field. So, um, people I really respect, but they they bring out the best that you never have to you have to be in the game. Mate, take it all the way back. Like, it was was it the grandparents that uh, that made the big move from Samoa and brought the family over? Was it that was it that crew that brought the, the Mialamus over here? Um, that, that was my uh, mum's parents, yep. and they moved to um, out of all places. They moved to Tokoro. You beauty, <laughs> nice. And yeah, I love that place. And um, they were probably one of the first. Uh, uh, migrants from Samoa through to Tokoro. They were there in the, I think they were there in the early fifties. So um, um, they made a, you know, when you th- when you think about taking uh, a risk of coming out of a place where you feel comfortable, and even Tokoro would be would have been moving to the big smoke coming from from yeah. Samoa. So um, you know, uh, our family have been lucky enough to ha- have our, our grandparents. Um, Think about having the courage to move out of uh, Samoa and uh, look where we are today. So, you know, we have a lot of things to thank, uh, a lot of uh, for our grandparents. And I mean, very similar, isn't it? Just swapping the uh, palm trees for pine trees, <laughs> yeah, no. uh, heading to Tokoroa, and and obviously you, you've you're a big carcass. That's genetics, and your old man, <laughs> bodybuilder. Did you ever want to follow his footsteps, or is that maybe you just making a late charge for it now at the gym? Uh yeah, my dad was a bodybuilder uh, when we were growing up, and he still lives today. Like. Um, He's that's awesome. He's, he's that bloody awesome. strong. You know, my dad, uh, my dad's sixty nine this year, and he's still. I, I just won't be able to go through life knowing that even as a professional rugby player, um, I will we'll never be able to lift heavy <laughs> at his age of sixty nine. Well, what, what sort of stuff is he? What sort of sort of tin is he moving? I remember uh, this was a couple of years back, and it was hard case. Yeah, oh, he's sixty seven. Sixty seven. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we were we were at the at Fit Sixty Gym. Um, and we've got a we've got a few benches at the back, so we had a group training on, and uh, he just popped in and said, "Oh, uh, son, can I use the weights at the back?" And he was, people were looking at him, and uh, he was doing some heavy bench. I don't know, like one twenty or something. And Jesus. all of most of us guys looking at him, and he was doing it for reps. We were like, <laughs> "Yeah, that's my dad." I felt pretty proud actually, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't bench that much, you know. So, but uh, you know, he's a um, strong man mentally, and uh, you know. It's, it's great to see uh, Dad uh, still being able to move like that, you know? There's not many people at our age could still say, my dad's tougher than your dad. Yeah, my, my dad's <laughs> tough. <laughs> my dad's pretty tough. <laughs> your dad's definitely tough than my dad. No issues there at all. But it was, um, you know, your old man's a pretty special guy, obviously. Like, um, someone who had a big influence on you. And, like, growing up in Tokara, that, that's got to be a great upbringing for a young fellow, was it, you know? down the dairy, down the park and bare feet, playing with um, mates in the neighbourhood, down on the bike, like sort of getting smashed around by boys two and three and four years older than you. What's sort of part of your rugby upbringing? Uh, definitely. You know, and I can say um, for me and my brother, we were lucky. Um, we, we come from a family of hard workers, you know, and uh, I think through our life, these are some of the things we've been able to take into um, what we've what we've learnt and try and pass on to our kids as well. Um, when, when you're talking about... Um, what is it, where did our rugby roots start as well? We used to go down to the rugby park uh, with our two uncles, like men, and they used to always, uh, we used to go two on two with them. <laughs> and now that I think about it, like, <laughs> you know, that when you get crazy. the chance to go, yeah, it was, I can't believe we used to do that. But they actually prepared us really well for Auckland because yeah. when I first played first with Dean here in Auckland, you know, I was going, I was playing against some little um, South Waikato boys, same age as me through to playing a first with Dean in Auckland and I was watching guys uh, come out with beards, full beards and moustaches and um, thighs like the trees we used to cut down and took it all. Um, so I wasn't ready for it, but I wasn't that ready for it, but I realised, you know, that those were the same things that we had been doing with our uncles. So, you know, things happen for a reason and uh, they had us well conditioned when we, we moved up to Auckland. At what point in your career did you move from the side of the scrum as a flanker into that front row position where you, th- where you obviously found your niche uh, and excelled so well in? Um, it was it was a year after I finished uh, school, and um, one of my my, uh, my good friends and um, coaches, and um, he's just 
and uh, Blister Soul, he's just recently passed away, um, um, Jeff Moon, but uh, he he said to me, Kev, I think you need to move position, and so I was on open side through our school, and I, I thought he was talking about going to the blind side, <laughs> 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 but I was really blindsided actually, you know, and he's, he said, oh, no, I, I think uh, you'd, you'd fit in really well at hooker, and um, I was really hesitant to be honest, because you know, if he was talking f- going further out, you know, like second five or out into the backs, maybe that yeah. would have sounded a bit more uh, nicer. But uh, <laughs> moving into a scrum it wasn't something I ever thought uh, would have been possible. But uh, he played in that position, so he spent a lot of time with me and we, we did some work in that um, position as well. And so, um, yeah, and I was just, uh, uh, it was a blessing to be able to, um, for him to have that insight and for me to um, um, be able to, to go so get as far as I did. So. That, it's a big move. That is, that's not, like you said, it's not switching sides of the scrum. That's getting right into the engine room, and, and, it, and that's late. I mean, obviously, most people would find their, find their feet and find their position at the, the end of intermediate and the beginning of, beginning of high school, and like you said, in Auckland, that's, that's not small bodies up front. That's men. <laughs> uh, how, did, how did the body react to that? Because it's a different muscle group. It's a different mindset. It's a different skill set. It's different uh, paths that you're running. It's a different attack. It's a different defence. Could you throw a dart straight, Kevy, in the early days? or I wasn't too bad, actually. But I, I can <laughs> tell you, I had a lot of anxiety, like throwing yep. lineouts, you yeah. know, especially when they were close to the line. And even um, when I first started playing EPC, like... I was throwing into guys like Robin Brook, yeah. uh, Leo Lafayette, guys that have been playing um, uh, at a high level, and he was this little kid trying to um, throw a, a straight dart to them, you know. So, <laughs> had a lot of anxiety in the beginning of my career, and I spent most of my time walking around like a mummy because my neck and shoulders were just like hadn't hadn't felt that sort of pressure before. Um, but um, it's a great place uh, to be able to. Tra- they, they're, it's a great position if you want to transfer their skills from loose forward. They fit in really well. You just have to. You have to be open to picking up uh, line out throwing, which is is different, and, and especially that uh, uh, working in a scrum. It will be because a lot of people often commented that it was like when you were on the paddock, it is like having an extra Lucy. <laughs> so that was kind of it. I guess it all makes sense when we look back now and and see that skill set. It's one of those ones. It's lines that you never forget to run, and it's lines that you always manage to pick up as well. And especially when you're when the the three that you're following around and and in the mixer with were so good, made made such a formidable team. No doubt. At what point in the uh, in your All Black career do you think that? I mean, because you've, you've seen the World Cups, you've, you've tasted success, you've tasted defeat. Uh, what team was your favourite across the board to be a part of? Obviously, you said that everyone sort of, everyone, every team special to be a part of every single time in 132 caps that you slid that jersey on, uh, have different memories attached to them. But was there one game, was there one team that just made you, everything was just absolutely nailed. You couldn't have been prouder of your performance. The boys just didn't skip a beat and it just went exactly to the song sheet. Um. I think, and I don't know if um, uh, people sh- share the same sentiment, but um, there's nothing like winning a Rugby World Cup at home. You know, uh, it's amazing abroad, but like uh, when your whole team of five million are, are right here with you, man, uh, the buzz was just like, it was unreal, you know, and uh, for everyone to get in behind it, it just, uh, yeah, it's pro- probably something that I, I, I think, you know, I'll never be able to rep- replicate being able to see my parents, my kids, my wife in the crowd, and uh, to be able to share this this moment with everyone, because I've seen videos of people watching at home, watching down um, uh, down on the waterfront, people that couldn't get into the stadium, and everyone was all blacked out. You know, so how cool how cool was it to be able to have everyone hey, behind? I can I tell you, I was first game, eh? I and, was uh, absolutely physically exhausted at the end of it. I sat on one <laughs> beer for about sixty minutes, and then afterwards I had to go home to bed. I was rinsed. I mean, oh, obviously mate. you guys are physically and, and and mentally and emotionally and. Uh, you probably would have been at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, but for me, as a person watching it, I've never, I've never been in tatters <laughs> more in my life. Oh, it was mate. like running six marathons back to back, and I've never run one, oh, nor man. will I. And uh, you know, like um, 2015 was amazing because, like, you know, uh, and I, th- I thought we really enjoyed the moment. You know, the when we yeah. look at look at the difference of the two, like 2015 was like, man, we're just going to go out here and just let loose. And but 2011 was a little bit different. It felt like we were just just uh, like thank God, thank goodness, <laughs> thank God, oh, thank man. God, <laughs> oh, thank God. Let's go home, honey. Let's go home. Let's just go home. Just chill out. I'm toast. But yeah, you're right, mate. It was, it was unreal. I remember mean, for the opening match of the 2011 World Cup. It was against Tonga at Eden Park. Yes. I went to that game. Intention was to jump on the train at Britta Martin, and catch it down there. Not a shit show of getting on that thing. <laughs> eh? It was absolutely rammed. It was a beautiful day. So we thought. We'll leg it. We'll walk there. We've got heaps of time. Mate, 
people were out. The Tongan supporters were out, <laughs> like making noise. The Kiwis were out. It sort of set the tone, and you're like, this is different. Like, <laughs> this, this feels different. And, like, it basically carried on like that for six weeks, didn't it? It was, yep. it was an unreal tournament to be a part of. And, like, you know, we can look back now and say, there wasn't a monkey on your back you know, from all those years of not winning it, there was a goddamn gorilla, wasn't there? <laughs> there but, was. <laughs> um, you know, it, was, it was unreal. But, you know, you boys got the job done and it was just a sense of elation and relief, wasn't it? No doubt. Um, yeah, they, they, these are moments uh, why I think it's so special because, like, so many people shared in it as well, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, no, amazing. Uh, have you ever thought now that your life after rugby, you've got Samoan heritage, uh, proud Samoan, uh, Kiwi, Tipping back into into the island, which gave you, I guess, your genetic blessings and uh, and and the the big, I guess, repaying the the massive move that your grandparents sort of took off on, uh, so that you can give back to the game over there. Yeah, I I always think about it too, and um, you know, we're very proud Samoans as well. So, I, you know, I, I think when the opportunity arises, and at the moment, like uh, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is a lot a lot lot more on the personal level. So just helping individuals, especially um, trying to get uh, front row as they head around being able to work in a scrum. And so um, I know it's a special skill set and special people that work up in that front row, so <laughs> <laughs> having to spend a bit more time with them so they can really enjoy their job. But uh, definitely uh, being able to um, get back in and and uh, share some of the things that I've been lucky enough to learn on my rugby journey uh, with our Samoan people is uh, something that I'd love to do as well. So at the moment, it's... Most of it's done here in New Zealand, um, but you know when the when the opportunity arises, um, definitely be there to help. So, talking about giving back, uh, head first is something that you're heavily involved in. Uh, Roundy can talk more to it. Uh, what what was it that that drew you to that particular group of individuals, and what is it that you do within Head First for those people that don't know? Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm lucky enough to be an, an ambassador for um, Head First, and um, something I feel uh, is really important. You know, um, uh, for our We've got a, firstly, we've got a really good target group. We've got uh, a good bunch of young men uh, that we can also uh, start sharing uh, some things around mental health and um, uh, being able to stay uh, keep keep your mental fitness up. So we know it's not easy. We we've got a good platform and we've got some really good people where they can share some some great messages. Um, the experts as well as uh, those that have influence, uh, but being able to share uh, with our young people that it's the right to to talk up, to speak, to share. Um, we come from proud, proud backgrounds, but realise that um, uh, showing some real strength is being able to talk about it. So um, yeah, I'm I'm proud to be able to uh, share in some of the workshops and be a part of it. And it's a it's a blessing that we can pass on the the knowledge and uh, wisdom that we've learnt and that, that we work alongside as well. It's a fantastic initiative, and what I really like about it is for quite a few years now, New Zealand Rugby through um, a number of player development programs, etc have really supported their contracted rugby players. You know, it's been a big focus for them, for um, that cohort of rugby players to give them as much support as they can off the field so that they're really good on the field. It's yes. awesome. And Head First is all about taking a lot of those messages and taking them to the wider rugby community, which is fantastic. But for you, Kev, like, you know, you played rugby, started your rugby in an amateur area, you yes. know, like a little bit in the, the high school and club times and then transferred in to pro rugby. Like, when you think back to those early days, because um, people like yourself and Richie are kind of, are living that now, you're, you're being a lot more open, you're showing that um, a bit of vulnerability is real strength. Was it like that though when you were a young fella, you know, like, or is it um, something that's we're getting better at, it's evolving and, and obviously you're a big part of? I definitely think it's a space that's evolving um, and we can't say that was wrong uh, the way we used to do it back in the days, it's just the way it was, yep. you know, so uh, sometimes it just takes a bit of courage uh, for people to be able to show this is actually a way of showing strength and... Um, not only showing strength, but also uh, being able to share with people. There's a lot of people going through the same thing. And if uh, you're able to say, you know, uh, and even if it is someone that you look up to, uh, say that I'm going through the same thing you are, um, it really levels out, um, normalises uh, what you're going through. And so, uh, you know, we can, we can definitely share as people that have been lucky enough to uh, do some, uh, some really special things that we go through every, that every everyday life. Uh, we are going through the same stresses and pressures um, uh, that most people are going through. Does it surprise you the number of people that, especially, I guess, in, in more recent times and, and in the code, uh, you're a professional athlete, you're training at the highest level, and then all of a sudden someone eats a bat and the whole world goes into a global lockdown and you can't play footy? And how, like, mentally, do, you would have, I don't know if you've ever been in a position where 
you're primed up and you're ready to go, you are a race car that has no track to race upon. How do you keep the upstairs in that sort of shape? And did you get a lot of people that are current footy players reaching out to you because you are seen as a leader? Uh, you famously said you are an all-black 24-7. <laughs> Uh, you know, yep. th- and that is a mentality. That is a that is a responsibility. How did did you get those people asking you for advice? Were you surprised by the number of people that were reaching out to you? Um, you know, uh, when I think about the uh, the, the advice that we're able to share with people, and um, um, it's it's probably stuff they've already heard, but I think being able to reinforce that, you know, like um, what's going on, we can't control it. So. Uh, where we put our energy is really important, and so those things are. What is it that you can tr- can control? Okay, there's a lot of stuff that you can do from home. Uh, I'd also add in as well that um, a real big part of it as well is just um, getting some perspective on on what's happening as well. Um, a lot of us are still safe, and um, our our families are safe, our circles are safe. Uh, so there's a lot a lot to be grateful for, and um, that mindset. I think that mindset's really important. You know, just uh, being able to be grateful for the things we can do today that a lot of places around the world can't even do, you know? Mm. Go down the road, we can catch up, do a podcast, sit this close together, and um, people can't do this. I remember getting um, an Instagram from uh, someone in Argentina too, and he was just saying, man, I love the workouts you, that you're posting. I've been in lockdown for uh, three months, uh, oh. it was like four or five months now, going on <laughs> to six months. Uh, so uh, could you, you know, thanks for your energy. And so yeah. we realise, you know, if you if we put start putting things into perspective, uh, realise uh, we we actually in a really good position and we're safe and uh, uh, we get to wake up each day, then um, things start to fall in place. Yeah. You know? Sonny Bill Williams uh, has famously said that he learned a lot from you whilst in that same mixer as you. And one of the one of the most important things that he learned was to be present and to be in your shoes, I think is what he, he said that you sort of, what does that mean, to be present and be in your shoes? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think being present is just, um, you know, when people are talking to you, like actually listening to them, I'm, I'm guessing, like, maybe he might have heard it differently, but, you know, being present is actually just being in the moment, really enjoying uh, the chance that we get to connect, and I think maybe being in your shoes is um, uh, just being proud of who you are, uh, we all come from different backgrounds, and uh, we're really proud of, of that as well, but uh, being able to share that uh, respectfully and uh and understanding people are the same too. They come from different backgrounds. Uh, that respect goes a long way. Mate, as you say, we are very lucky here in New Zealand to be able to have sports fixtures. You know, fingers crossed, you know, as the weeks tick by, we might be able to get some people back in stands again. But there was a time when we had full stands. Like, are you someone, as an ex-player, were you keeping an eye on, on Super Rugby Aotearoa? Are you watching uh, Mata 10 Cup at the weekend? Are you someone who keeps an eye on things at the moment? I do, and I must admit, uh, when we that first game back down, uh, back in from lockdown, um, you know, because you watch heaps of rugby, I was the same too. Just like you know, if there was a rugby game on, sort of have a little look, and then you go and grab a coffee and come back, you know. Um, but um, when that first game was back, and you get a chance to go down to the um, down to Eden Park. Man, I I grabbed my everyone and we <laughs> keep us fizzed up. Yeah, we, I was fuzzing and <laughs> and it was an afternoon game and it was yeah. sunny. How good! It was amazing. So you know, just um, I missed it. Yeah, I missed the live games and um, to be able to get back down there and and watch it and feel that energy of what the guys were doing on the on the field as well was amazing. And also too, like you played um, during a period of real strength for the Blues. You know, like it was halcyon times for the for the club or the franchise. Carlos Spencer. You know, the Brook brothers, oh, you know, yep. coming in behind Fitzy, yes. like um, Jonah for a period. Um, you know, there's so many good footy players in that team, a real period of strength. You know, the Blues are on the way up. It's awesome. And, you know, and to see a Ronnie Clark's boy playing, Hoskins Satutu, you know, like yes. some of these great Blues legends, like does that get you excited as a as a 164-game veteran for the Blues to see the boys on the rise and some of those great Auckland Blues names sort of at the lead of it? Oh, no doubt. And... Um, there's been a lot of hard work and a lot of good work being put in, in, in that space as well. So I think just to be able to see um, their evolution and they, I don't know, it's just when I, when I look at the way they play too, it's they um, it's different to the way we used to play back in our day, uh, back in my day. Oh, I sound like I'm like <laughs> really, really. I like, I like how you lump us in there. Yes, yeah. carry on, back yeah. in our day. <laughs> sure, yeah. It was great. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I watched. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the... But you can see a blue style that yeah. uh, that you can sort of uh, recognise. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I love the way they're playing. You know, um, they're playing free. Uh, you see smiles on their faces again. So uh, they're playing physical and they show backbone when they um, when they defend their line. So 
Oh, it's you feel proud as a as a as a former player being able to watch um, a team that uh, that you love and uh, have so much hopes for uh, do so well. Do you uh, send a couple of text messages to Tana? So maybe getting tighten up here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Words of wisdom for the big man. Well, you know what? On, on that first game, so, hey, read. what's with those haircuts? With those boys, all right? We didn't do that, all right? I know. All the, all the, all the girls at the gym were going, what's up with the guys with the blonde hair? <laughs> Man, they're winning. You just let them do their thing, all right? But, um, you know, that first game we went to, I was looking at the, the guys on the sideline. We had Carlos Spencer for the Hurricanes. Yes. Tana Umanga. Dan Carter was on the sideline. Leon. Corey Jane. You know, so like, I think the sideline was worth more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite a bit of money spent on the sideline. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. And, but, again, it always, um, for rugby today, and it's taken a bloody long time to get to this point, but the year after a World Cup is always exciting because um, a lot of guys move on. Like, if you think of your 2015 team, you know, shin- Centurions, you know, like Richie, Conrad, DC, you know, yourself, guys all played, you know, over 100 games, the All Blacks moved on, and, and it made the next year really exciting. Um Excited about the the squad that's been named. Firstly, we've got one named. That's awesome. And secondly, we've now got a couple of games to play as well on October the 11th and on October the 18th. We've got two games, Bledisloe Cup games, things that you probably have um, great memories about. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to see our uh, young blood of um, All Blacks coming through. And, um, you know, when you you see the genuine um, um, excitement uh, when when you get to see someone share with their parents first time becoming an All Black, you know, so... The true emotions here. That uh, these are things uh, that that I can um, that I can feel with. You know, I can. For you mate, with. can you remember? Yeah, I was going to um, say. Yeah, Did getting you named in the All Blacks. You got that um, that famous, internationally famous uh, Tupo when he when he you know brings his you know, FaceTimes his parents. Like mate, I don't think there's a dryer that's watched that clip. It's that's just right. amazing, eh? Yep. Yeah, and to Roundy's point, do you do you recall? Who called you? How how did that go down? Was it a uh, was it a gilded envelope that was delivered in a limousine by somebody, or was it a text message on the Alcatel DB Touch? <laughs> <laughs> I can show my age here. I was listening to the uh, to a radio. Oh, oh yes, you <laughs> beauty. We had, yeah, we had just finished. Um, we had just won the uh, NPC, which was cool, yep. and uh, we had a, a team function with our families on uh, Waikiki Island. So we were by a resistor. Oh, sorry, what was that? What are they called? Uh, the transistor. Transistor. Resistor. <laughs> transistor radio. And uh, we're all under a tent listening, so it was pretty cool. You know, pretty old school. Yeah. <laughs> Showing my age a little bit there, but um, uh, there was no call. It was actually, we, we heard on the radio, yeah. so yeah. pretty cool. Hey, what's the, what sort of goes, did you have an inkling that you were in the frame, that you, you had the chops for it? Because, I mean, it was there were no easy wins there. There were no easy positions to get into and to be named in that in that team. Because who, who was making up that team while oh. you were in it? No, we had some some great uh, All Black hookers in uh, Anton Oliver, oh, yeah. Mark Hammett. So um, there were guys that were uh, awesome, at, amazing at their craft. And so um, yeah, no, I, d- I uh, you know, you always you always want to hear your name, but you never really think uh, that uh, you had a chance of getting uh, your name called out. So you know, pretty pretty amazing to hear hear it, and um, I can still remember that that moment uh, today. So yeah, no, I'm looking really excited to see how young All Blacks go yeah. and. Um, uh, when you see them excel in the, in the space as well, because when you see our young All Blacks come through as well, one thing I really appreciate is the the good coaching and the good environment they're in because they all excel. There's you don't really see a young All Black come in and yeah. fall away. They all come through, and you see even better of, of what you've seen from them already. So, to use Tupo as an example, uh, Jared Hoyata, good friend of good friend of ours, who's uh, who managed to take him under the his wing. Enforcer. Oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's a number of things, and that, <laughs> that is one of them. Uh, he he saw a lot of promise, and he and he rates uh, Tupo highly. He said that he turned up as a chubby kid from South Auckland, 130 kilos, and they really whipped him into shape. And he said that he is he is a born leader. He work. He's got a great work ethic. He's a he's a great humble guy. He's he is going to be an incredible All Black. And his his game, what a year! I mean, he's absolutely excelled. Taranaki Chiefs and now ABs. You can almost see when you're watching that Taranaki game on the weekend, which is controversial. Man of the match, <laughs> the bloody the <laughs> Very penalty try, unreal, controversial. <laughs> Let's get the record. Don't Jacko get, on. Don't I want get me started. Um, but when you see it, it's almost like, and we spoke about it earlier in the office, that you see somebody get get the nod and then the confidence, and you throw that much confidence into a carcass that big with that much potential. And he just went up another couple of levels and might attend it. Yes. Do you see that as well? I do. And, um, you know, if, if we're not only talking about, like, rugby players and stuff, like, you can see how much difference um, belief makes in a person, yep. whether that be on the sporting field, whether that be 
uh, you saying to your kids, you know, awesome work, keep up the good work. You know, like we can take this, like we can, these are like real things that we can take into everything yeah. we do and whether we are um, parents or bosses or whatever, you know, like coaches um, doing this at our gym, give people self-belief because you'll yeah. just see them jump out of their skins and um, perform at levels you thought that this is their potential. It's like we were talking about um, before we came in, one thing about COVID, a positive aspect of COVID is that a bunch of people were required to work at home, you know, yes. people who normally work in an office space Yes, and there's a bunch of probably, dare I say, old school traditional leaders within business who felt normally they need those people in the office, they need to be keeping an eye on them, they need to make sure that they're in this particular environment yep. and that's how they think they're going to be most productive had COVID, and for a number of these organisations, they were as productive or more productive with their workforce at home. Yes. They've given them some trust. You know, Now they're saying that you can continue to do that because, geez, um, I've seen that actually you're very good at your job. You don't need me standing over you all the time. Um, and it's by giving those people that trust um, that they're thriving, aren't they? And that's exactly t a sort of thing what you're talking about. Yeah, I never used to think when people would say, don't work harder, work smarter. I used to think, ah, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. You're a hard-working guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, different, there's a different piece in there as well. I think work hard and smart, you know, yeah. so you can see how much more uh, efficient people are at home. Take out, you know, working here in Auckland, you know, take out two hours or two yeah. and a half hours each way or either way, like how much more efficient you can use that time getting up a little bit later, having a coffee and actually, okay, I'm going to start work now. So. Yeah. You've achieved a lot, uh, probably more than what most people could achieve in 10 lifetimes. Uh, what next for Kevin Mialamu? Um, you know, the space that I'm working in at the moment, you know, uh, I'm, look, I'm lucky enough to, like I'm doing some uh, work on a local board in Papakura as well. And so it's just, uh, I'm just trying to keep wi wi widening my lens. Um, still working with Auckland Rugby and I'm lucky enough to be on the board there as well. So um, there's just, I'm just on a... Um, a path of just keeping keeping uh, growing, uh, keep uh, learning more, and um, I'm working around some amazing people as well. I'm um, with uh, Drug Free Sport as well. So these are spaces that, um, um, like I said before, I'm around some really good people. I'm learning a lot of new things, uh, and um, that's always encouraging. It's something that uh, you look forward to getting up in the morning when you're, when you're learning some new skill sets. You were saying that you like getting out in the outdoors and you're lifting a couple of heavy packs up and down a few big hills. Mm. Uh, any thought about getting out there into the nature? You said you'd be doing a little bit of trail running. Are you going to pick up some weaponry and go and fill up the freezer? Because, I mean, that is a body that takes a lot of uh, a lot of prime. Take on Richie and God's own, you know, <laughs> yeah. get into this ex-player multi-sport yeah. craze that some of these people get into. So you're in a, bit of a, a, a little bit of a leotard <laughs> on a road bike. <laughs> I'll just uh, correct you. It was um, <laughs> trail walking. <laughs> 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 just walking. Um, but, no, I definitely... Uh, had a chance you know it's one of those things I never did as much walking as we did uh, because of COVID you know so yeah, yeah. now getting out into uh, uh, into a few trails uh, with a few of the boys and taking a few packs out you know um, it's good to do it you know like <laughs> just opening up opening up uh, opportunities and different things that I, that I wouldn't usually do so I want to finish on one yarn um, that during my um, you know regular extensive research that I do to carry Jay through these pods <laughs> is um, <laughs> was um, there was a little yarn there about you know, uh, you know, one of your heroes growing up, Sir Michael Jones, yes. um, another great Samoan All Black, um, and he was saying that a young Kimi, Kevin Mialamu coming through the ranks, um, playing him um, in club rugby, heard a bit of heard a bit of a reputation about this young fella, and he thought, in in almost the most respectful Samoan way, he decided he was going to line you up and smash you. That was um, his <laughs> words, and it just happened to be the kickoff went straight to you, and also as we became so accustomed to throughout your career, he thought. In good Samoan heritage, you'd run straight into each other head on. But you put a bit of footwork on him and left him behind in the mud. Do you remember that, mate? Because uh, I think he does. I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyone would be crazy enough to run straight into yeah. the ice, man. <laughs> <laughs> as, as confident as I could be, I would never do that. Yeah. You know, not even on the training field. So that's, smart. that's, that's hard and smart. <laughs> hard and that's smart. Hard and smart. Hard and smart. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mate, I think that's us, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Hey, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and and, uh, and sharing some some pretty spe <laughs> some pretty special memories. Um, we, we do appreciate it for everything that you've put into every single jersey that you've ever slid into Thanks, uh, on behalf of New Zealand uh, and your adoring fans across across the globe. Thank you very much, mate, and really appreciate the chat. Look forward to doing it again soon. Uh, once you get uh, another pack on your back, maybe a rifle over the shoulder and, and start filling up some freezers. I'll tag you in. That'll be us, <laughs> Amy. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thank you, Rob. mate. Thanks.